Hey, welcome everybody to day five of day four, excuse me, time goes by, uh, day four of the Industrial Hemp Workshop. I'm Patricia Barrett. Today we're going to hear from Tiger Fiber Hemp Company. So we're going to learn all about Tiger Fiber. Our, our first speaker is Rich Selby, and Rich Selby is the, I guess we're going to call you the CEO. Does oh, that no. sound appropriate? No? Actually, the C, uh, CFO on loan from United Cooperatives, and also I do agronomy, and uh, I'm not really a CFO guy, but uh, James and Jared kind of, we, when we were going around the room, they kind of looked at me, and I'm like, okay, I'll be the bookkeeper for now. So that, I, I, under, I understand how that goes. <laughs> well, uh, James and... Um, Jared are also going to be speaking today. So we will hear from all three of you. And what I'm going to ask those watching is to mute your, I'm going to mute you and then you'll have to unmute yourself. I'm going to allow you to do that. And you are allowed to unmute yourself, but I would ask that you respectfully do not do so uh, while our presenters are speaking. If you have questions, uh, please post them in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat at the end of our presentation. We will have the, the Q&A uh, time period. And um, again, thank you, Rich. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, James. Uh, I'm going to mute myself and stop the video. And the only time you'll hear from, uh, stop my video. The only time you'll hear from me is if I think we need to fix something. So uh, thank you very, very much. And gotta get to the right place. And I'm doing stop. All right. Does everybody hear me? Huh? Yes, we can hear you. Go okay, is, are we ready to go? Yes, sir. Okay, well, hello everybody and thank you for uh, listening to me. My name is uh, Rich Selby and uh, my partners, uh, Jared Killoran and James Forbes are on the phone and they compliment me quite a bit and they say that I have the perfect face for radio and the perfect voice for silent movies. Um, <laughs> I'm not the best uh, Zoom speaker in the world, but I hope I come across okay. Um, so a little bit about me, just quickly. I'm the board president of United Cooperatives in Plattsburgh, Missouri, and uh, myself and United Cooperatives were, were proud shareholders in a company called Tiger Fiber. And uh, it's been quite a ride. This company has been going on for about two and a half years. And uh, I'll probably do most of the talking, but uh, Jared Kaloran, our CEO, and James Forbes, our COO, are on the line. And probably during the question and answer, you'll hear from them. But first of all, I want to thank uh, Patricia Barrett and the University of Missouri. Um, you know, I've been in, I've lived in a lot of states and all around the world. And I, I, I really think that the University of Missouri Ag Extension System is the best on earth. And uh, I'm honored to present today. And I also want to thank uh, the Missouri Department of Agriculture and especially Mr. Alan Freeman. Um, he always picks up the phone when we have have questions, and sometimes they're 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 not great issues, but he's very helpful. So we got a great group of people uh, at that hemp department in Jefferson City, and uh, um, and I want to apologize. We are in the middle of a very big growth spurt in the company. And uh, I, we haven't had time to listen to some of the other present presenters, although I did a little bit yesterday uh, with, with Dr. Ray and the others there. And uh, uh, we hope to keep the presentation as short as possible because uh, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions and uh, I'm sure Patricia will, will uh, monitor those and uh, or moderate those. And we hope also that this presentation will not be a big, uh, braggadocious promotion of our company or braggadocious or whatever that word is. Um, we want to keep it focused on what's going on in this uh, hemp fiber approach. Um, and I want to highlight one thing before we get started. There's a huge difference between fiber crop or uh, fiber and herd 
crop, and I'll talk a little bit about that, versus the CBD model. It's a completely different uh, ball game. And uh, also the last thing on the first slide here, we're not experts in hemp at all, but we know enough to be dangerous because we've been doing this 24 seven, um, plus managing a co-op and, you know, uh, for the last two years, we have a lot of hands-on experience. And a uh, couple, here's our, the, the three amigos or the three musketeers, uh, Jared Kaloran, um, he's been our CEO since last summer and it's been a great, just great to have him as our president and CEO. Um, he's very visionary, has a lot of energy, and he's just a great guy. And uh, then in the middle, uh, that's me, Richard Selby. Uh, I've been in global agribusiness uh, for a long time, and you know, I've been I've been in agriculture since I was a kid. And then James Forbes on the right side, he is our uh, also quite a visionary and. His main wheelhouse is in the processing side of things, whereas mine is more farm gate and in the finance and treasury right now. Um, you know, we're still a small company, but we, we're, we're onboarding people as we speak. Um, and I'm on, and then uh, um, James, not only processing, but James has a lot of marketing knowledge and where I'm a dumb dumb when it comes to uh, greenhouse growing, I, I can do it outdoors, but James is, absolutely super in the greenhouse side of things as he manages, or he's, he's a shareholder in a large uh, indoor organic farm operation in St. Louis. Um, so the next slide, um, I think everybody knows this, it's no secret, you know, the, farm, the problems we're trying to address. Um, the farm economy is still struggling, um, even though, you know, we've seen a, a, a jump in commodity prices in the last six months or so. Um, what we're trying to do is give the farmers a different option in crop rotation uh, here in the upper Midwest and hopefully a new sustainable crop that can be more than just a commodity, a lot of value added, and we're going to get into that. Um, and also tiger fiber, we have nothing to do with marijuana, medical, legal, illegal. We're not in that ball game and we're, we have nothing to do with CBD or, 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 you know, we might, incorporate some aspects of uh, the phenotypes of, you know, in the CBD, the CBG, and that maybe later when we get more established as a, you know, a fiber hemp company, uh, but it's more than just fiber. Um, we, uh, our, our opinion on, on the, you know, the medical marijuana and the CBD industries is we believe that they're, they're in a bubble and there are a lot of growers and, and there's a lot of, uh, instability. And we think that we have maybe a more sustainable approach uh, that's more outdoors. And, uh, but, but that said, we do want to make partnerships with, you know, the, the waste stream of like CBD, like some of the waste uh, unusable trim and stalks that we can consider. Um, and so I think fiber, uh, the fiber hemp can fit in well with, with these other people, you know, and, Urban centers are losing industry, uh, pollution, greenhouse gases, uh, dependence on, on the foreign materials, especially in the, in the fiber hemp industry. It's all coming from, for the most part, coming from Europe and China right now. And, you know, we believe, and we've seen research from Europe and a lot of other places about topsoil losses um, that, that we, you know, we think that it fits to manage soil problems. Um, and I was involved in a project in Eastern Europe a long time ago uh, using canola rapeseed around the Chernobyl nuclear uh, damaged lands. And uh, um, when I left the program, they were looking at, at the hemp crop to help with the radioactive nuclei uptake and clean up the soils a little bit. Um, so, you know, it's a high demand commodity. Um, there are already large scale manufacturers in the industry um, it's definitely going to be a mass market disruptor. Um, BMW, Levi's, Patagonia, the big, big companies, you know, we're working with automotive companies right now um, to incorporate uh, hemp products into their production. Uh, we believe it's a beneficial rotational crop uh, and a third partner in the corn bean rotation. Um, and also, you know, it, it incorporates well, uh, 
it, it could be used in the cotton wheat rotation. It kind of depends, but we know that we have competitors in Texas doing it with the cotton rotation and wheat. Um, it, it does reduce dependence on pesticides, um, even though we, uh, we know that um, there are some EPA registrations coming, coming down the pipe, uh, mostly fungicide and insecticides. But, you know, weeds are a problem, but we believe that this will be much less dependence on pesticides. And as I said before, I'm a big believer that it's gonna help successfully uh, mitigate some soil conditions. And so the next slide here, I think a lot of people have seen this slide. Uh, the 50,000 known uses, there are a lot of different uses. Um, we'll cover what our focus is on um, in, the late, in the slides coming down here, the ensuing slides. Uh, but the hemp plant in our world can be divided, uh, divided into uh, the herd, which is the inner woody core of the stem and the fiber, which is the outer layer that gets stripped off uh, via a process called decortication. Um, and the, in our model, uh, and we're also interested, we're looking into some new uses in the seed and flower and taking that top percent of the uh, plant off in the harvest process and then taking the biomass below at a later date and mowing and mowing it uh, letting it sit in the field to break down the fibers and then bailing it up and then comes to our our facility um, but the stock in that biomass can be divided into uh, three different categories one is about 76 percent of the stock is what's called the herd that woody inner core 20 percent is fiber and then we've budgeted about four percent for losses in um, processing or losses in the field or foreign matter that comes in in the bales that we we inspect when they come in to, and we don't want to have any foreign matter greater than four or five percent and again we're still learning a lot we're not the know-it-alls and uh later on down we'll show you a crop budget model that we have and um but but also if you do go for the flower and the seed to harvest it we we're, we're of the belief now and we're still researching that you might lose some quality in the fiber. And this is what we're trying to pin down uh, this spring and some research that we're doing. And we've got very good, a very good consulting engineer team working on this. And then um, if you look at the slide, you go to the right bottom and you see the personal hygiene market and you go to the left side and you see the textiles. And then you see at the top, there's the building materials and foods. Uh, the personal hygiene market is well developed in the United States. Uh, there's very good uh, lotions, uh, Hemp Z, which is a big brand. Uh, and my daughter uses it to when she's in marching band in high school and she rubs down her legs after a long hot practice. Because of COVID, she didn't have much of it this year, but um, she's a marching band person and she, she swears by it. Uh, the food market has come from Canada you know, Manitoba hemp hearts, and there's a lot of good uses that are still being researched in, in food and also animal, animal nutrition as well. And then the building materials, we're quite focused on that for the herd part. And then on the left, you have those textiles, um, you know, Patagonia, some of the famous companies in the world are already making hemp apparel. And so uh, I think, you know, a lot of people already know, uh, know about what the hemp plant can do. Um, and so that's why we think it's gonna be a game changer. And then uh, we were, a little bit about us, we were uh, incorporated in August of 2018 with a pretty ambitious goal about uh, to, to start disrupting these mass markets with industrial hemp fiber. Um, not, not necessarily uh, replacing cotton, but being blended with cotton and some softer materials and not necessarily uh, replacing uh, gypsum for drywall. You know, we, we, we have niche markets that we think are gonna grow. Um, and uh, we basically, uh, I guess we're, we're, we're very fortunate after we started the company to apply for a, a grant that was awarded to us by the Missouri Agricultural Small Business Development Authority or MASBDA. And they gave us a good jump start. And I especially want to thank Jill Wood and Marley Young for all they've done to support us. Um, and as a part of that 
uh, funding, we were able to partner with uh, Kaffner University of Missouri, and we managed to get what we thought, we think, you know, we were the first uh, kind of multi-location outdoor uh, research plot partner with the University of Missouri. And, and boy, did we learn a lot there. And I want to thank all the research stations that participated in that effort. There were seven of them. And results varied across the board. And we really liked what happened um, north of the I-70 corridor on both sides of the state. Uh, plots in Albany, Greenlee, the Greenlee Research Center in the eastern part of the state, south of Kirksville. Um, also, uh, this year, we got a lot of great results in the Cape Girardeau area, south of St. Louis. But this doesn't mean that uh, other regions uh, cannot participate. We, we just look at our, the data from our needs as a company and where we're located. And we also made a great connection with uh, the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis. And, and they're helping us with some THC testing protocols uh, that are private. And um, also, uh, thanks to Masvida and um, other, you know, other investors, we were able to uh, acquire and install processing technology. And we believe still in the United States, there's fewer than, than 10. There might be 15 now, but what we know of, there's about 10 companies like us um, throughout the, uh, the United States that are, that are still on the beginning side of things. And then um, the next slide here. And also, oh, by the way, and also we are, uh, we, we've broken ground. We're in a facility in North St. Louis and we're in the middle of some equipment switching out, but we plan to be in full uh, herd and fiber production by May with bales that were either bought or produced in our network this past fall. And then when the 2021 harvest comes in, we'll be hopefully getting up to a, a capacity of, of processing. And uh, so that's, that's really big news for our company. Um, but now on this next slide here, the early markets really were focused on a base clean uh, herd, which is the vast majority. Herd's gonna drive the market. Uh, everybody likes to think of the, the textiles, but that's only going to be about 20 to 22 percent of the entire hemp plant. So we've developed some partnerships and we've retained consultants that are experts in uh, in in using hemp crete or uh, special panels that are made from hemp um, to fit in houses. And we're working on uh, zoning laws and 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 some of those uh, regulations that we have to follow. But um, this has been uh, really, really a great uh, opportunity for us. And we believe we're gonna sell everything we make, whether it's in animal bedding or absorbance or in the construction industry on the herd. And then on the fiber side, there's a great shortage of, of hemp thread. Um, I've been trying to get uh, import hemp thread and hemp hats from China and the, they're out of the hemp thread. It's, 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 it's off the shelf, it flies off the shelf. And we want to bring that to the United States. Um, and uh, I guess that's that's kind of. And you see some other, you know, like hemp straws and and the and the Patagonia jacket there, and and car paneling, which we are working on as well. And uh, we've also made some inroads into the medical industry, and and we're we're working on some research and patents there. And then the next slide. Um, you know, what's going on now is it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Uh, there's, so you've got the producer side, they want, they want the new crop, they wanna make more money than they can with corn and soybeans, but there's no processing. So you gotta catch up the processing side and the processors are hoping that the growers can produ produce the, the right quality that we're looking for. And we're surprised though, a lot of growers in Missouri have come with some really good uh, bales of hemp for the fiber and herd, and we're very happy. And su not surprised because farmers are, uh, we don't have to tell farmers how to grow this. They, they, they come to us and tell us how, what to look for and how we should help other farmers grow. And that's the fun part of the job, I guess. And um, then the next slide here, um, you know, hemp, hemp fiber production is, it, it, it's, 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 it's a cost prohibitive because it requires a large amount 
of capital to get into the market. Um, we were saying it takes a minimum of $6 million to get a basic processing plant with four to five tons an hour of, of, of processing capacity, but we've managed to whittle that down a little bit. And we were faced with a multi, you know, almost a multi-year lead time, but now we've managed to uh, buy more uh, US sourced uh, uh, conveyors and things like that, that, that kind of speed us up. And so we should be ready to go in you know, May, uh, May 1st, May 15th, to be able to, to roll out uh, uh, our processing center. And, uh, but you know, our focus is on making uh, base herd and, and base fiber that, that goes down the, 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 the chain. And uh, I guess the next slide here is why, why St. Louis? Um, because it's a big city and why are we in the city? Well, we're on the north side of the city, but we have a lot of local support from the, the community. Um, we've gotten some um, incentives to be there. And also it's very close to the river and this is gonna help us logistically and, and the rail, it'll help us logistically be, because um, transportation and logistics is very important. You gotta keep those costs down. Um, and also we've gotten good, resu good results uh, as far north as Hannibal, far south as Cape Girardeau and around the city on ag land. Um, and uh, another reason we're in St. Louis is, you know, not only is the countryside hurting in America, but the urban, uh, the, the big cities are hurting. And there's a lot of friction in our country now. And Tiger Fiber's mission is to bring the rural areas and the urban centers together and create a lot of jobs and a lot of finishing jobs. So in the future, we'll probably see St. Louis as more of the finishing center um, because we, we can't be moving hemp bales in very far distances. So as we grow, you're gonna see more of these processing centers uh, pop up based on the private investments that are being made into our company. Um, so that's why we're in St. Louis. Uh, and the industry present, uh, position, um, industrial hemp is much younger than the CBD markets. So I think everybody knows that, but we again feel it's much more sustainable and our vision for the CBD, and we, we think it's gonna eventually be taken over by big pharma, unfortunately, um, and it's gonna move indoors. And so we just really feel that we're, our focus is on the hemp fiber crop and the herd. And also in our findings, um, we've, we've seen some uh, acreage cap, uh, worldwide acreage cap. Uh, for instance, in, in Western Europe, they've been growing uh, hemp for industrial hemp for textiles and herd for years. And they've had to move into Eastern Europe to catch up to the acreage. Whereas, uh, you know, North America, Russia, China, parts of Latin America and Africa have more acreage. And that I think, you know, being in North America, we have a lot of land and the farmers need income. And um, we've also been in discussions, we've got, you know, market demand, and it's, it's kind of weird. You always think, well, where are you going to sell? Where are you going to sell a finished product or, or the herd and the fiber as you process it? And, you know, because we talk to investors all the time and that's their big question. We have purchase orders that are contingent upon volume. So they're like, they're, they're, they're letters of interest, but they're, you know, they're serious. Uh, but we cannot keep up with the demand that we, we couldn't produce the demand that, that like Levi's wants tomorrow or, Ford Motor Company wants tomorrow. So we have to, uh, you know, to keep building and getting up to that scale. The real challenge for us is supply chain execution. So logistics, uh, processing efficiency. So that is our main goal. Um, and then uh, on the bottom right, the government support. Um, we've gotten a lot, like I said, you know, we are just, just thrilled with the, with the, um, support we've gotten from uh, MASBIDA, uh, Department of Agriculture in Missouri, and the governor's office and legislative and the city of St. Louis and, and other regions. And, and we're in the process also of moving it more, our company into the federal grant and contract uh, realm of things. And we just think that this government support for all hemp companies, not just ours, is gonna be greater going forward. And we're in the process of, uh, 
some multiple USDA grant writing that that that's kind of like my Saturday morning is sitting down and writing grants and things like that. Um, so we're we're pretty hap happy with the industry position that that this fiber can play. Um, and this is this this next slide here kind of shows the history of hemp. If you go back into the Civil War period, uh, Platte County, Missouri, St. Charles County, Missouri, they were the leaders in hemp production, making shipping masks, rope. Uh, one of my co-op employees came to me with a excerpt from a Platte count a Platte County a uh, newspaper back in 1870 that said Platte County led the United States in, in the production of the hemp for the shipping masts and, and rope. And, you know, and, and also on the other side of the state, we've seen that that was true. And so that it, it just, Missouri has a great, great history and a great footprint. And so on this slide, you'll see, you know, St. Louis is our first center, but we are actively working with other uh, regions to roll out our next plant. So right now, though, in St. Louis, we're, we're perfecting the operation before we roll out to the next center. Um, so that that's kind of our goal there. And uh, so again, um, thanks to Masvida, our, our grant support, uh, Tiger Fiber was able to travel throughout Missouri, North America, and the world um, to to look at look at these markets, the, the hemp markets. So we kind of started on the marketing side and worked our way back into the processing because we know that farmers and grow growers are smart. They can figure this out quicker than, than any of us at Tiger Fiber can. And so we've got a few growers that are on our team and, and they're just awesome. And they're, they're coming up with uh, innovations all the time. Uh, so we've got a great, you know, a great, uh, uh, network, but it all starts with the seed, and we've tested over uh, 12 different varieties of seed, and we think we've we found a home run. Um, and we're currently working to register these varieties with the Missouri Crop Improvement Association in the state level this year, and we've launched a an in-house seed genetics and genomics program. Uh, and uh, so I think we're going to keep a lot of this in-house and roll it out. Um, the equipment manufacturers, we got to visit a lot of equipment manufacturers and, uh, we've, uh, uh, found some really good, and we think we have an optimal line and it. It's not just the, the separation of the herd and fiber. There's a lot more to it on the finishing end, but I think we're really making a lot of progress. And I think everybody in Missouri is going to be proud of us one of these days. Um, unfortunately we can't, get into great details because some of the equipment providers have their own intellectual property and we have some of our intellectual property. So we have to kind of protect that. And uh, lastly, um, we've been working closely with a wide variety of buyers in different market segments in, in the finished goods. And we've provided them with samples, which takes a lot of work, but we're encouraged by the interest. Like I said, it's going to be more about supply chain execution and efficiency than it really is about marketing. Um, so that's kind of uh, the, the value chain network plan right now. And then I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this slide because we talked a lot about all the support we're getting, but we've gotten tremendous support also, not just from the uh, University of Missouri and um, Masvida and the Department of Agriculture, but the Department of Economic Development, SLDC, uh, USDA as well on the federal level, Danforth. Um, and we're also very proud to be members of the Missouri Hemp uh, Producers Association. There's a few associations and I think we picked a really good association. We're founding members of that, of that group. And, and again, here are some of the other partners, some Canadian partners, Justin Peterson, um, some, some, other companies in Western Canada, California, some companies in Europe, United Cooperatives, and of course the St. Louis Regional Chamber has been a big help. And uh, James is involved in good life growing and that brings a lot of greenhouse knowledge uh, to the team here. And uh, not much room on this slide, but you see that we're looking at a project projection on this slide this is not our data, but 
by 2022, we're looking at about a $2.2 billion industry. But I think that number is low. I think it's going to be a little bit better than that. But the real big game is, you know, this is like soybeans in the 1950s, right? So we're on, you just think about, you know, talk, I've talked to my, my grandfather before he died about, you know, corn and soybeans back then and how all the innovation that went on then and look at it now, look at all the uses of soybean and corn now. Hemp's going to go in the same direction. And I would not be surprised if this is not a one trillion with a T global market by 2030. So this is how big this market, and that includes CBD and some of the other segments, not just fiber. But this is what we, we see now. Um, it, you know, this is going to be a game changer. And, you know, we like to think of ourselves as the Google of the hemp industry, but, you know, there's a lot of good companies, not just ours. Um, and this is kind of the slide that everybody likes to look at. And again, we're not experts, so we're still tweaking these numbers. Um, but uh, I think I wanna go, go with some basic points. I think the, the folks did a great job yesterday of covering a lot of this. And I won't go into details on field selection and, and the need for soil samples, but it does start with soil testing before you select a field and go get a permit, because the permit costs money and you wanna make sure you have the right soil conditions. And another point we need to make is you do not want a seed, outdoor CBD crop or a feminized seed crop growing near a hemp fiber crop. So yes, talk with your neighbors, make sure they're not growing. You know, that's why we, we feel that CBD really does need to stay indoors. And I know people will disagree with that, but we need to be careful. We don't want to ruin anybody else's harvest. And, and you know, because the CBD growers have put a lot of money in it. Um, so that said, on the left, you kind of see the budget and it looks kind of large on the input side because in a lot of it's because the seed costs are very high. Um, we, we, uh, we, we, we populate per acre a lot more seed than a, a CBD grower or even a, a, a fiber or like a, even the, even a seed grower for food. We're looking at anywhere from 42 to 48, 50 pounds an acre with narrow planting because we want to create a, a good canop canopy, you know, helps with weed management, but not too close together because you like, like, like the professor said yesterday, you don't want, uh, you know, diseases to sprout up um, in the crop. Uh, that seed cost needs to come down below $100 in the next couple of years. And, and that's why we have a, a genetics program. We're under a licensing agreement with a base germ plasm, and we're in the process of doing crossing and, and setting up genomics right now to try to get that seed cost down. And our goal is to get it down below $100 by 2024. Um, and then we put a lot of the in the variable costs. I mean, still, you know, there, we're we're trying. We would like to have everything organic and mechanical, but with Palmer amaranth water hemp and a lot of, you know, mare's tail up here in the northwest part of Missouri. There's a lot of obnoxious weeds, and so we have to control those. So we do have a burn down plan with a residual in the, in the, and also a seed treatment is very important. And we think that that will help the germination rate. Um, one, one aspect we don't have a good solid number on is the crop insurance. And so if anybody on the line here knows the hemp crop insurance market, we would be wanting to talk with them uh, because when we go to, map out crop insurance, there's not really a clear delineation between CBD and uh, hemp fiber and CBD crops are much more valuable and much more expensive. And so you, you know, the premiums that we have to, we have to work that out, but we've, we've been starting to talk to a few companies, but that number is not solid on the crop insurance at all. Um, and, and of course we, you know, the, the bailing costs are quite, quite high. Um, and, and then storage drying and sheds and land rent there, uh, you know, based on some averages that we've seen in the market. Um, and then, uh, and just, just so everybody knows, we are developing a, a tiger fiber grower program right now, and we're not quite ready to release it yet. Um, so when we look at the right side and what you expect with, uh, you know, bale revenue and, and fiber seed revenue, uh, those numbers still are, we're still working on them because 
if we do a grower program, we need to back up our commitments because we're developing a grower agreement right now. Um, so those are very preliminary numbers. And again, that seed part and the insurance part are the tricky ones. Um, and also the bales and the quality of bales. And, you know, are we going to put docking fees in for foreign material and uh, hemp stock diameter and things like that that go in to accepting the bales? But we're opening a uh, grower program to a very limited group of growers that we already know very well for 2021. So we vet our growers. We make sure that they're healthy and they have good backgrounds. And, uh, but I, you know, but we'll be, we'll be expanding this to other growers in the future, but, but the numbers fluffy or not, we really do believe that uh, this industrial fiber hemp could net $100 an acre or more over your, your gross national average of corn and bean acres. Um, so we're looking at anywhere from 200 to, you know, uh, well, 530 is if we have the seed and the bales, but um, we, we really are confident that, that we can net a farmer or help a farmer to net, if he manages it right, he or she manages it right, we can help them to net above $200 a profit per acre. So that's our goal. Um, and uh, we found a, a lot of good Missouri growers that and they didn't have, I was surprised that they didn't have to make a lot of adjustments on the planting side. Um, you know, they, they've been able to make minor adjustments to their drills or their planters and get it in the ground. Um, but one thing we found out is we, 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 our planting depth was, uh, and like, like they said yesterday, it doesn't like a lot of water when you plant. You gotta make sure it's a relatively you know, dry soil bed when you're, when you're, when you're planting. And, um, um, but uh, the real hard part, it, and, and also you, know, you can top dress and how that affects you know, your, your THC levels. But the real hard part is making sure that you time your harvest. It's very complicated. Uh, it, you know, you, you want to do your testing, uh, you know, at that, I think it's 15 days before harvest and you don't want to be late. So the planting window is about uh, Mother's Day, plus or minus a week. And then, you, you know, if the, it depends on the seed variety, but you're talking about probably an early August, early to mid-August seed cut. But you want to get the testing done. The grower is responsible for the permit. I mean, Alan Freeman will tell you that. You got, that grower has to make sure that they do it right that when the inspector comes out, that the testing protocol is done right. And, uh, you know, and we need, we need some, a couple of good labs here in the state of Missouri. That's one thing that I think we all agree to um, because we've had to send out of state and we, you know, uh, to help a grower send out of state and we haven't gotten answers back. We had to retest and it's been a little frustrating, but uh, suffice it to say these Missouri, I'm so surprised. I don't know if I should be saying I'm surprised, but these Missouri growers, like I said, they, they'll, they tell us how, to, how they're growing it and we just sit and nod our head. Um, but one other lesson we learned is when you, when you do plant it, don't stick it in three quarters of an inch or an inch deep. Uh, with our varieties, they can be about a quarter inch to a half inch maximum. Uh, it doesn't like a deep, a deep drill into the soil. Um, and uh, so I guess, you know, there's a lot we can talk about. So I wanted to leave it open more for the questions on that side. But, uh, you know, the baling, um, well, the, the seed cutting is, is difficult because you, you have to elevate your combine header, like a draper header, elevate it. And, and that, that can be frustrating. Um, but, you know, we're, we're more in it right now, really, for the, for the baling and the fiber end of it. So we're in no way experts in the timing of the seed cutting. But we're eventually we're looking at some technologies in seed and flower uh, with some partners that we we have and some shareholders. Um, but again, also on baling and and mowing, when you're mowing, you want to use a disc mower with a very sharp blade or a sickle, a sickle bar with very it has to be extremely sharp, like titanium sharp. Um, otherwise, you're going to have gumming issues. You know, don't ever use a rotary. That happened at one look. I'm like, no, stop what you're doing and get a disc mower. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not the farm, farm super expert, but you know, 
I, there, there are some farmers that really know what they're doing with this. And then when you're after your mow, after the mow or the cut, you want to use a real heavy crimper, which basically is a massive weight on top of the fiber rolling over the crop to break down the fibers. And then there's a redding process, but with a new technology that's our intellectual property, we're going to cut down the, the, the fiber softening time substantially. Um, we're still researching that a little bit, but, uh, um, and then the baling, um, you know, most of Missouri, most of the United States are in big round bales that you see driving on the roads. In our opinion, that's not efficient. We would really like to go with big, big square bales on 50 foot, 53 foot trailers um, and keep, you know, and keep the fields as close to the processing plant as we possibly can. Um, but again, we, you know, this is gonna, there's gonna be a lot of unknowns and we're still learning lessons. Again, you know, we're no experts. And so with that, I think, you know, before we open it up to, to questions, I want, like I said, I wanted to keep this short, but uh, um, our email address is, you can find all three of us there, uh, Rich Selby at tigerfiberhemp.com, Jared, our CEO at tigerfiberhemp.com, um, and then James at tigerfiberhemp.com. We work, we're, we're a tripartite one. We're, you know, one plus one plus one equals 10 because we, the synergy between the three of us, we're always consulting each other and making sure we don't make a, you know, like I don't make a cowboy move somewhere without telling James and Jared. So we're very unified, but you can write to either one of those addresses and, you know, for follow up or our questions about the company questions about, um, you know, the direction of the fiber industry in general, because we're here to help. You know, we're not, we're not out to be a monopolist in hemp fiber. Um, we're just growing this company. We've got support from our co-op, you know, and the other co-ops are interested to kind of convert more into the hemp side and, 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 and given a seed storage space. And so anyway, we're excited. And again, I want to thank uh, Patricia Barrett for letting us have this opportunity to speak today. So I guess that's kind of it. Did you uh, say, uh, Rich, thank you very much. That was yeah. very informative and really interesting. Did you want to give Jared and James a chance to speak or shall we just let them uh, answer questions? What's your thoughts on that? I'm, I'm, I'm open. Okay, so know. we've got a couple of uh, questions in here. All right. Um, James answered a question from Connor, a comment from Connor uh, that uh, the best fibers harvested prior to flowering because as the plant matures and begins flowering, the woody interior core, the herd, expands its mass to support the added weight. This reduces the amount and quality of bass fiber. And then... Uh, I did put Jason Mashoff's contact information in there. Mm -hmm. Jason is a CBD producer, yep. Uh, but he also has a uh, hemp crop insurance product through his United Crop Company. So he may be, I think he'll be a great resource for you. He spoke last year at my group and he raised hemp uh, in Illinois and then in mm -hmm really Morgan County yeah. around here uh, la this year. So so he'll be a good resource for you. Great. Um, Mindy says she visited the old Cargill facility in Sykeston and it was dubbed to be the first tiger fiber processing facility. Is that still operational? I can I can answer that unless Jared or James would like to answer that. James... James put it in writing. He says okay. we've relocated from Sykeston to consolidate our efforts into St. Louis. It was yeah. challenging to cost effectively bring in raw bales from southern, from northern Missouri down to the southeast. Yeah. And Mindy asks, will the St. Louis location accept fiber from any hemp farmers or only those contracted with Tiger Fiber? I would say that that process is under negotiation. We could we could negotiate. We, we'd have to, we'd have to, you know, we, we go through like a pretty, pretty strict process to look at that, but 
you know, we, we're, we're, we're very open. Um, we, we like to know where it comes from and we'd like to have like an identity preserve system. So we know where it's coming from and, and, you know, make sure that it wasn't doused with pesticides or it, it, it wasn't hot or, you know, and, you know, I, I'd want to make sure before we did anything out of state, I'd want to check with Alan Freeman to make sure we're following the rules. I think that's a very important fact to keep yep. in mind. Yep. Uh, James says that they will accept fiber from, from um, producers who do not have a contract with you. And Dr. Babu is asking which fiber traits need to be improved in future breeding. That's Lincoln University. That's great. James, James is the, do you, do you want to handle that, James? Because this is a processing question more really, I know it, it sounds like an agronomy question, but that fiber quality is the processing part. Uh, we've got some genetics that, you know, we, we, want, we want long fibers, but James is the expert on, on that. Can you, can you unmute James or? I, I just uh, figured out how to unmute myself. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, can you repeat that question just so I can answer it um, the most intelligently? Yeah, the, the, the question is, which fiber traits need to be improved in future breeding? Um, well, I guess um, the, it stems from just the simple fact that most of the hemp crops that it historically thrived in the Midwest were um, destroyed after the passage of the 1937 uh, Marijuana Tax Act. But um, just to directly answer the question, um, it, it needs to be bred to have a, a more focused vegetation phase. Most of the breeding that's been um, installed here in the United States has been for performance with flowering and potency of flower cannabinoids. Um, what that does is increase the upper weight of the hep crop uh, and the biomass, meaning that you have more woody interior core. Um, we need to adopt genetics that replicate what happens in Asia and Europe, where they go for the taller, thinner stalks, which um, have less weight on the upper part of the plant and a thicker um, exterior bass fiber. Okay, very, very helpful. Uh, the, the Connor Choice has been participating all week and he represents a a company called Hempire. Uh, there, he says they're another operation very similar to yours in the Kansas City area, and they plan to be operational this coming August. Uh, they'd love to work with you on their side of the state, on the uh, west side of the state. So I'm just sharing that with you, and and I can easily uh, share his contact information as well, which I- Excellent, yeah, no, I, we've heard of this Empire. We'd, we'd love three. to work with him. Okay, very good. Yep. And I'm, I'm, I'm north of Kansas City in Plattsburgh, Missouri, but I, I live on the north edge of Kansas City, so it'd be quite easy to set up a meeting. Uh, probably not this week, but uh, you know, going down after the blizzard that we think is coming. Yeah, yeah. I know I did post yeah. on that. <laughs> Uh, of course, there'll be a blizzard because I have to come to the office tomorrow. Uh, do you have a timeline for bringing on those regional processing hubs? That's a good question. We Again, we want to perfect the first one, but go ahead, James. Um, yes, um, it is dependent on um, some business activities that we have going on right now. Um, we're, we're primarily focused on making sure that our very first facility is um, replicatable. We want to work out the kinks on a relatively small scale that still allows us to keep the lights on and people employed. But once we have more firm demand from our customer base, and it really, I don't want to say perfect because we won't ever be able to perfect it, but once we have a stronger knowledge base amongst the farmers that we work with, and can expand where the crop is being produced at critical scale, um, critical scale being 10,000 acres and above. Once we establish that there's an interest from the farmer and we can establish community-based relationships with people um, in the, the geographical regions that we want to expand into, then, um, then we can make those business decisions on when to install the processing infrastructure 
and um, roll out the, the agronomy program that Rick is overseeing. Okay, so um, that was that was good. And I have got we've shared a little bit of information back and forth. So I've got a couple questions. If nobody else does. Uh, I was interested in the we call it hempcrete. Is that a lighter product? Is it flammable? And is it um, do you have a license for it? I mean, I don't know, copyright, not copyright, a patent for it. Um, this is, this is James again. And, um, so the, so the phrase hemp creek, um, is actually a Canadian trademark, but, um, it's kind of just the phrase we use for the mixture of hemp herd, hydraulic lime, and water. It is a lighter, stronger version of Portland cement concrete. Um, the way that we plan to apply it is with a pour-in method for affordable home building, um, but we do look towards making prefabricated blocks for simpler assemblage. Uh -huh. And the, um, the reason that it allows for it to be lighter weight but um, have a higher strength um, ratio is because at the molecular level, and I'm really borrowing what I'm about to say from PhD scientists that we worked with in Edmonton, Alberta, but cannabis as a plant has a really high concentration of lignin, pectin, and cellulosic carbon, and it has a lighter uh, or a larger surface to weight ratio than any other plant we've experienced in the plant kingdom. Okay, very interesting. Uh, I'm interested in the car paneling, uh, the vehicle paneling uh, product that you also were displaying. Is that kind of like a fiberglass? Is that kind of how the, has it got a similar, um, I guess, molecular structure? Yes. When we visited um, the group in France that is currently producing the door paneling for Audi, BMW, and Mercedes, it was almost a one-to-one -one replacement. Very interesting. That's, that's a really interesting opportunity for, for the future, I would certainly think. Uh, and so do you, when someone contracts with you, say a producer is planning on raising a hemp crop and he contracts with Tiger Fiber to produce a fiber crop, are they going to come to you for the seed? Yes. Yes. We've already procured seed for thousands of acres and we're in the process of registering that uh, okay. with the Missouri Crop Improvement Association. And assuming that goes well, the real, the real uh, um, answer is that we have to vet the grower too. I mean, there, it's a two-way street, but we would supply the seed uh, in, initially anyway. So. Okay. Um, so Mindy also asks, and I saw that you responded, Rich, but I'll read it anyway. She says, so you're not adding farmers at this time. And is there a waiting list for farmers to get on for the future? And uh, of course, you kind of were talking about that for, via email, but is yeah. But is, I, I guess I guess we're open. It it kind of it, it it's kind of like we we'd have you know kind of like a uh, bilateral inter interview where we would have to vet each other to make sure it's a good fit and make sure that we the farmer you know, kind of get to know the, the growers a little bit better and, and understand what they have with their machinery and what their history is. I mean, I go back and look at their, their corn and soybean harvest just to kind of see how they've done over the years too. Um, and I don't want to hurt the, we don't want to hurt the farmer and, you know, 
and we want the farmer to succeed. But yes, we can we can discuss. Um, we're it's getting kind of tight, but we, you know, we have some openings right now. So there's really no okay. waiting list. It's more of a we want to make sure that you know it's a good fit. Yeah, and and of course, as we as we realize that you you have to as a producer go through the state of Missouri hoops to make sure that you have appropriate permits, et cetera. Uh, it says, uh, Connor's asking uh, the cost of $380 per ton for raw input to be processed. I, I, there might've been a mistake on slide 16. I think it's a lot lower than that, but you know, we've, <laughs> We've we've bought we've bought as low as 160 to you know 130 to 160 per ton, not per bale. Um, uh -huh. and it, it, you know, and it depends on quality. So all right, very, very interesting. And now I'm gonna tell you straight up that I know there are people who would like to take a tour of your processing facility at some yeah. time in the future. Um, so I know, and that's that's an issue. <laughs> We, we, well, we're, it's we're going to, yeah, we're going to not, um, for the foreseeable future, we're not going to allow any uh, tours of the facility because we're under contract with, with equipment providers, our own uh, processes and technologies that we, you know, at this stage, we, we it's probably a no-go. So, well, but, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, in the COVID world, Right. I have to keep it close and tight. Yep. I've got, a, you know, a local processor here who may allow us to take tours, but they're limiting the size of the tours to four people. So, you know, that's like you say, the world, the world changed a little bit um, this last year and, and we're just not as, as free as we would like to be in this. Right. Year. And plus um, we, we cannot release any uh, names of uh, equipment providers or manufacturers, but I'd be happy to sit down with, with Connor and have a coffee. I don't live too far from the North, uh, I understand. North, North Kansas city. Yeah. And, and that's, kind of that's, and what Rich was saying was what company manufactures your machine and, and his answer, what Connor was asking Rich is, and, and of course his answer is we're not going to release that at this time. Um, did, Dr. Babu is asking if the budget that Ray Massey uh, offered yesterday is comparable with your budget. I was it. I I got to listen in on the first speaker who was more on the CBD side, and then uh -huh. I had something come up at the co-op, and I had to jump off, and I didn't see his crop budgets. Ray and I have sat down before and compared them, um, but we've compared with a. Uh, 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 another grower that's grown a lot of hemp in the state of Missouri. And we were very close to his numbers. We were like $48 ap apart on inputs. And that's not much considering that this is a new industry. So, yeah. And, and as Ray explains, and, uh, you know, somebody who's kind of been intimately involved with crop budgets uh, with the University of Missouri Extension, is, you know, they're, and they're just guidelines, you know, they're, they're, they aren't necessarily, this is what it is. You have to know what your inputs are. The spreadsheet is set up so that you can correct those numbers, input your own numbers, and then project, you know, your cost benefit based on that. So, you right. know, it, it, it's important to know this is this is where we want our producers to keep very detailed records. Right. And and speaking of numbers, there's one lesson that we've another lesson that I learned personally this year. I and I heard I've heard other people say the nitrogen. Um, you don't need that much nitrogen, and that that I've learned is not the case. You need at least 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre for fiber crop. Uh, We've tried 110, 120, uh, you know, but the, the P and K, number, the, the phosphate and potassium numbers that they presented yesterday were right on. Um, and, you know, I manage a co-op with 110,000 acres. And so we kind of know for corn and beans, but we learned these uh, lessons this year on 
nitrogen and in sandy soil sulfur like a uh, uh, sulfate ammonia you know ammonia sulfate AMS uh, is good on sandy soils I think and uh, boron and 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 you know there's always this back and forth between manganese and magnesium really it's magnesium that that the hemp plant likes I, you know so uh, um, even though manganese is the big outdoor but if you look at the indoor of the hemp plant it's 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 magnesium and so we're still trying to figure that out but like you said these numbers it the grower will tell us what those numbers are more than uh, us dictating to the grower yeah, that's very that's very appropriate. And and as we know, you know, every crop is different. They're all differently sensitive, and uh, that's where your soil test gets you started. You, you know, uh, before you, you know, before you, like you say, commit commit those dollars to the to the right. crop. And also, uh, you know, going back to committing the dollars and the money to it, um, you know, we've had problems all over Missouri with decamba spray drift and I, I know that uh, the gentleman yesterday from the Ag Econ department had talked about that and uh, that's that's a big reason for our relocation up farther north um, not not necessarily all you know the, the only one but decamba drift uh, and not being close to feminized seed because you don't want to ruin the CBD uh, producers crop with male you know with, with any cross-pollination or anything so yeah, that's a very interesting uh, and important point is, mm -hmm. is at least know your neighbors. Right. <laughs> right? Uh, say, I want to address one thing while I've got everybody on the on the line. Um, some people have expressed they are not getting in to see those YouTube videos and I'm making available in that Casa comment email. So I have been going in and giving permissions to individuals, you know, who are associated with this particular uh, group, but some people do not have what they, what Google is looking for as a Google account. And Mindy, you're one of them. And so if there's an alternate way that I can get that YouTube video to you, I may just make it unlisted and share the link with each of you. Um, please communicate with me. Uh, mostly, you know, it was kind of being mean about just if you don't have a Gmail address, you can't have access to the videos. Well, obviously I've made promises and I like to keep my promises. So if there's an issue or an alternate uh, email address that you can share with me, I'm happy to make those, those videos available to you. Who, who else has questions? I think we've had a really excellent meeting today. And Rich and James and Jared, thank you very, very much for this, for this excellent presentation and this conversation. Anybody else have, have questions? Uh, they can feel free to uh, unmute if they, if they have some questions. I don't mind, we're, we're pretty casual here today, right? As long as we can hear right. each other, that's the important thing. Right, and we we designed the presentation to last only like forty five minutes, so we could have the questions. And and I'm sorry we can't answer every question, but uh, you know everybody has our email addresses. And, the, yeah. and by the way, Jared's probably not talking because he's on a business. He's he's driving by car because of COVID on a on a trip. So good for him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's all it's all good. Me, I'm outside in front of the agriculture building, so no big deal. No, I'm yeah. not really there. As you can tell, that's my background. But uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, well, uh, unless anybody has anything else, and and James says thanks for having us and the ongoing partnership uh, as a Mizzou Kaffner graduate. Yay! It's an honor to work the university, and and Rich and I have talked about our Iowa connections. Yeah. Uh, which are pretty pretty strong to uh, raise our, our daughters in Iowa and between yep. my master's in professional ag at Iowa State University, uh, to one of my daughters was U of I and she went to the Orange Bowl last time they she she was in the marching band so that'll date her a little bit date me a little bit. <laughs> 
Oh no. Here they went to the Orange Bowl. And yes, I remember and, that. And you know, it kind of breaks your heart to have them not go to the Liberty Bowl this year, but I guess they won, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> Who are they playing? Oh, oh I think it was M-I-C-Z-O-U. So. <laughs> It's yeah, awful. there were a lot of people in the co-op that were very disappointed because we had some, I don't want to break the law here, but we had some side bets going on. Of course you did. <laughs> so that's all right. Sports betting is legal yeah, now. For everybody, I went to the University <laughs> of Iowa as a rebel, you know, uh, because all my family wanted me to go to Iowa State because I grew up about eight miles right. away from Iowa State. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, which is probably why you didn't want to go. I did some grad school at Iowa State, so I, I got back in good graces. With everybody. Yes, yes. And uh, like I said, I, I was working full time as a warehouse examiner, so I've been in more than one uh, green elevator in my time. So, uh, so we talk the talk, you and I, and we understand each other quite well. But anyway, yeah. I, thanks to everybody. We'll be back tomorrow. Michelle Poindexter uh, from Mokana Extracts is going to be our speaker. Yeah, I'm trying to get on for that. I'll be working okay. from home, well, so I should. <laughs> so, and also thank all- you to Dr. Babu for, for we, 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 we're big fans of Lincoln. I believe you're, he's from Lincoln University. Is that, is that correct? Yes, he is. And he's yes. formerly from Mizzou. So go. we're all connected one yep. way or the other. I so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to thank you guys and we'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Yep. All, all right. right. All right. I'll have Here. coffee with you, too. All right. We will when the COVID okay. stuff is over. Sounds good. Okay. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. Yep.